actually, I had a quick question for Michael. Did you take in the Mars Briggs? Are you an intuitive? Um, I have, and I was fascinated oh, okay. by it. <laughs> but we'll look for it. We'll, we'll follow up with you on that, find out what you are. We'll look at your blog, too. Um, but, um, yeah. you know, I, I think I would never say that I think recipes should die out because I would feel sympathetic for all the S's out there. If you are a sensing cook and you rely on recipes, and as Andrew had already mentioned, we know people who are really recipe dependent. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. I mean, uh, we've got a lot of really great people in this room who probably would feel very sad themselves um, to see recipes die out, not just for professional reasons, but for personal reasons. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful way, the replication, the duplication of something that's come before. It's a way to keep history alive. It's a way um, to channel into something else. So I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I think that um, there are new modes of recipes, and, and maybe we don't even need to call them recipes anymore. I mean, people do call the Flavor Bible a cookbook. Um, do you call ratio a cookbook? Um, I call it a cooking book. There we go. Okay. Yeah, no, exactly. It's like, you know, we have these, Names that we throw around. We throw around cookbook. We throw around recipe. What does it mean? We actually, I, will, I would love to go and just show the, uh, the last slide of what we think the perfect recipe is before we end, because I think it, it can be anything. And as we saw, you know, different examples from history, I think we're going to see a lot more different examples in the decades to come as we come up with new ways as we, of understanding how other people think about things. Some people are only going to need a few key aspects of technique. Some people are only going to need a flavor pairing to be able to come up with something new and brilliant. So. Um, I think anything we can do to kind of help that kind of innovation take place, I'm all for it. I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm fairly certain both of your books live in the cooking reference section as opposed to the cookbook session, section if a, if a bookstore Depends on the that. bookstore. Yeah. yeah. I would just like to add one last thing on that. And that I think there's a lot of room in the headers of recipes for people. So if 67% of people are feelers, write to them, sort of, you know, in that header, bring them in to your world. I mean, God, if you've just worked, you know, five weeks on getting the best enchilada recipe, share that love and say, this is what's going to happen when you make this enchilada recipe. I mean, really talk to their feelings. Don't say, the secret of this enchilada recipe is having that quarter teaspoon of jalapenos. People are going to go crazy. Say something like, God, the jalapenos are going to, you know, rev up everyone's palate. They're just going to be complimenting you. Or that again, this is the secret to this dish that really brings up everything else. So again, get into your feelings and bring it in the header. And I think that's what brings me into recipes a lot of times. I was reading Lynn Rosetta Casper in her book, New American Chef, said, here's how an Italian cooks the chicken. This was what she was, they take a pan and they fill it with some olive oil. Then they put the chicken in and they brown it and scrape, scrape the brown flavors off. And then they throw in a couple leaves of rosemary, you know, and they whistle that around. And then they throw in a little bit of tomatoes, and it's all done on a low to medium heat. And that's how an Italian would cook a chicken. Technique. A feeling. It's like, I actually did do that. And again, I cook chicken like a restaurant cook up until that day. Take the pan, throw it on high, throw in the bird, have it, you know, sear, 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 throw it to a 450 degree oven, pull it out in three and a half minutes, and have it ready for lunch within 15. Just like a restaurant cook, I always cooked it that way. And I slowed down. And you know what else? It brought out the feeling side of it. I am a feeler. And also, I'm like, I had a connection to this dish. I was in Italy. I was having a conversation with Lynn. I, I learned a whole new way of cooking. And so I think there's a lot of room in the headers to bring people in. Michael, since you do write recipes all the time, despite your distaste for them, um, is there sort of a one-size-fits-all recipe? When you think about the audience for your recipe, um, how does that factor into your writing of a recipe? Yeah, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge question. And I know everyone who out there who writes recipes uh, grapples with it. Um, no, there is not one-size-fits-all. I mean, there's somebody who's a really aggressive home cook who knows a lot, has educated him or herself about it. Um, and then there's a, a novice who just wants to, you know, I want to make my own chicken Caesar salad. <laughs> um, so you, you, have to, you have to know who your audience is for a given book, a given project. Is it an advanced group? Um, well, if you're writing for an advanced group and you write too simply, you're going to turn them off and they may think ill with your recipe. If you write too, too complex, uh, you may prevent people who need more instruction. I see the digital age as being a great advance and potential for this um, in, in, in terms of, we've got, uh, you could actually, there's room now to have an advanced method uh, uh, or simple method um, for people developing digital cookbooks, ideas for digital cookbooks, I think, I think a lot about that. Um, 
No, there isn't. It's a, it's a, it's a good question, but I think that you can make, if you write it well, um, so, to, so it's a pleasure to read, um, you're going to get all audiences. So for you, Karen and Andrew, um, thinking about your book, who was your intended audience when you were thinking about this book? Was it for the novice? Was it for the home cook, the restaurant chef? And then in your experience, who has it turned out to be resonating with? The most. You're talking about flavor bible. Flavor bible, right? Yeah, I guess we think of them, you know, as, as uh, brother and sister, and they kind of go together because the culinary artistry really focuses more on classic flavor combinations, and flavor bible more on contemporary post uh, 2000 flavor combinations. And so um, we really think that they work well together. And um, I think, you know, when we came out with culinary artistry in 1996. Um, and we realized that a book like this had never been done before, and to us, who are so ingredient-focused, we really thought that the key information that anyone who needed, liked to cook, needed to have at their disposal is what flavors work well together. And, you know, when I, when I tell the story, I sound like a shrew, so would you tell your political cool story? Okay, I take a moment. Um, <laughs> the, it's embarrassing to him, so I can't talk. The, 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 the uh, inspiration of culinary artistry was I was a young guy working at the East Coast Grill under Chris Lessinger, a legendary cook in Boston, and I decided to to make dinner for my gal, and had, you know, we were making dinner, and I made some pork chops or something, and I went, oh, I'll make some polenta. So I made this big, big batch of polenta, and I think it might have been the first time, so I was cooking it from scratch, and for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna flavor it, so I'll throw in some goat cheese, because I love goat cheese. You know, yeah, that just sounds good. And then I threw in some cilantro, and whipped the whole batch up, and served it to Karen, and took a bite, and said, why'd you serve this to me? It's awful. And I tasted it, and I went, she's right, this is awful. These flavors do not go together. Uh, we threw the whole batch of polenta out, we ordered a pizza, we just took the bullet. But that was when we realized, you know, as a, and it certainly as a young cook, I realized, gee, not all things go together just because I like them, or it needs that touch of color. So it was a but, hard story. But I think story. that those failed, um, those failed experiments can obviously yield um, really important insights, as it did in this case, where with culinary artists, we, we, we really thought about, well, how do we never have to throw away food again because we made a stupid mistake that could have been prevented if we knew whether or not these flavors were compatible in advance. And so that was really the hope. We weren't sure who that would be useful information to because in uh, 1995 when we were contemplating it, it didn't exist. Um, we thought it's either a really stupid idea or it's a really brilliant idea. And um, so we kind of hid it in culinary artistry. And culinary artistry is about so much more um, how to think about seasonality, how to put a menu together. Um, we focus on a lot of other aspects of culinary composition and thinking about culinary artists um, as artists, the way that others had studied musicians and how they composed music, or poets and how they composed poetry. We really wanted to study culinary artists and get inside their head and to show how chefs really think. Um, so I think at that point we really didn't even think there was an audience for the book, quite frankly. Um, and so when culinary artistry, when that actually proved to be the most popular aspect of the book that, that there was so much word of mouth about, we realized that um, we had something there. And when we started looking at uh, flavor combinations, we realizing that there were so many more out there that we didn't cover in culinary artistry that there was perhaps, it was perhaps time in that diffusion of innovation chart to um, finish uh, uh, a little bit more of our thinking on the topic um, that we've been working on since 2000. So we came out with two, uh, Flavor Bible in 2008. I think we hoped that there would be professional, or that there would be home cooks who would find it of interest. And in fact, because the, the diffusion went from professional chefs who are, you know, sort of the trend centers, people are now in our uh, celebrity obsessed society, they're the celebrities. And so people look to them, and then once uh, the professional chefs have endorsed it, then the home cooks want to be, you know, the very uh, enthusiastic foodies want to be up on the latest trends and the latest books, and so they'll follow along. But I, I think we, we weren't really sure. We thought it was a little advanced with the home, but we have been absolutely shocked that home cooks have embraced the Flavor Bible the way they have. What's funny is people who've been using the Flavor Bible have been writing recipes from it and putting them on their blogs. Right. So here we are, a book with no recipes, and everyone's creating recipes. So it's right. great, all those intuitives are being fed and in turn feeding others.